Okay, how many of you have had children with uh, temporal lobectomies or hemispherectomies? Okay, how many of you have children that have had uh, temporal lobe or have temporal lobe epilepsy? Well, those of you that raise your hand, uh, I don't know how many there is, but probably all except maybe one or two have a child with a central auditory process. It's almost unavoidable. Uh, and you'll see why uh, when we talk about uh, some of the things that we want to go over here today. So I'm Frank Music, that's true, and uh, I've been doing this for a long time both as a clinician and as a researcher. So I was a director of audiology and a neuroaudiologist at Dartmouth Medical School for 26 years. I was both professor of neurology and otolaryngology and audiology at Dartmouth. I then took a position as director of auditory research at the University of Connecticut, both at the speech and hearing and at the medical school. Then I retired and moved to Arizona, and the University of Arizona recruited me. So now I'm working at the University of Arizona, where I run a neuroaudiology lab out there. So that's a little bit of my background. Um, I want, I spent a lot of time, you know, you're the hardest group to try to speak to. It's easier to speak to uh, scientists in our field of clinicians very hard to speak to you people about a topic that is not even well known in the professional world. Uh, and uh, you know, the lay person has a real uh, challenge, I think. And so the challenge is also mine in terms of trying to get across to you as much as I can in as short a period as I can to allow you to best help your children. Okay? And uh, I don't take that lightly. I take uh, teaching as a very important part of what I do. So I've thought a lot about this, and I really think the best way that I can uh, do this to get impart the information uh, is to try to teach you as much as I can in the next hour or so about how we hear, uh, rather than giving you lists of things that you jot down and then in 24 hours forget. We want to try to kind of talk to you, uh, make it more of a story type thing so you can try to remember some things about it. Because I think if I instill the concepts about hearing and hearing disorders related to the brain, uh, I think it'll carry you further than if I was to give you a list of things that maybe you could again apply to the tomorrow or the next day but forget in a week. Could you use the Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank yes. you. <coughs> okay, is this is this on? The one at the podium. Oh, that that'll work too. I just oh. probably need to flip the switch. This will be a lot better if I could use it. Yeah. Is that it? One, two, one, two. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. I can speak loud enough, but I know it's for the recording. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry about that. They told me that three different times. <laughs> okay, so anyway. Uh, so I think by doing this conceptually and kind of talking to you, I even brought a chair so I can lean over and talk, pretend like I'm talking to, you know, just my friends. We'll see what we can do here. All right, now, the first slide is the most difficult one. And it is one that I don't like to talk about a whole lot but I think you people have a tremendous and important task in front of you in terms of caring for your children as best you can that have had epilepsy, uh, temporal lobectomies, not too many commissurotomies anymore, but uh, hemispherectomies. So I have to be absolutely candid with you. Um, but if you run into audiologists, don't tell them I said this. <laughs> they say, they'll be after me. So, uh, let's look at audiology as a profession discreetly and take a slice of it. So you can primarily look at the practice of audiology, which does require a doctoral level degree, a clinical degree, it's called the ADD. Uh, and I, there are more areas in this, but these are the 
the main ones, okay? So if you wander out there and you come across audiologists, uh, the most common one you're going to come across are those audiologists that deal with hearing aids, okay? And specifically, those people are going to deal primarily with the elderly people who need hearing aids. And that's going to be a big part of the practice that's very important, and that's a big part of what audiology is today, okay? So that's one part. The other part, I mean, you'll go to medical centers, and there will be audiologists that work primarily with uh, pediatrics, very young children. We're talking from day one up to six or seven years of age. That's what I would classify that. And those evaluation with those kids requires special training, no question about it, to do it accurately. So that's another big part. The other part is diagnostic, which I was brought up in. And unfortunately, diagnostics, which was the foundation of audiology for many, many years, has drifted a little bit to the aside. And uh, there are a number of reasons for that, mostly number one. But uh, diagnostic audiology is kind of what we're going to be impinging upon here today to some degree. Mostly you find these people in big medical centers where it's important to differentiate whether the problem is a middle ear problem or a cochlear problem or a brain problem because they're all treated differently. Then we come into the area that you have to be aware of, because this is what's going to get you the most bang for your buck, and that is what is called neuroaudiology, or and or the assessment of the central auditory nervous system, or central auditory processing or auditory processing. They're all synonymous, OK? This is what you've got to look for. Because to evaluate your children the best, you're going to have to find people that can do this, okay, can do it well. Now, here's the rub a little bit. Of this group, of all the audiologists, just a little bit, a little less than one-third of them actually practice uh, in terms of neuroaudiology and or central auditory assessment. So you've cut two-thirds of the people out who just probably wouldn't know a whole lot more than the person on the street about what that is, to be honest with you. The other part of that that we don't want to tell anybody is that of that third, there's probably only a third that really know the game, okay? That really know the game. And so, um, Right? And then there are audiologists that are general audiologists that you can think they do a little bit of everything, and there's a fair number of those out there too. The range from the very best audiologists, okay, what we call the audiologists that practice at the top of their license, to the ones that are kind of to the bottom of it is huge. It's huge. The difference is huge. Um, some surgeons who do various kinds of surgery and do it day in and day out, people all over the country, are far different than do that surgery once every year. And that's kind of what we're talking about here. Well, the ours isn't so much in terms of um, practice, it's also knowledge, because the central auditory nervous system requires a heck of a lot more knowledge that a lot of people want to think about. And a lot of people even avoid it because it's a tough, tough area to navigate and learn about. So here are some key questions that you should ask, okay? Because I've been around this block a hundred times and I can tell you a lot of people like yourselves get into an audiologist's office, follow through and find out at the end of the day, this is not what we do. So some key questions, and they're very simple, but I think important. First of all, do you do neuroaudiology or do you do central auditory processing? Right out of the gate, do you do it or don't you do it? And if you don't do it, don't say that, yeah, you can manage it or whatever. Important question. How many do you do? Do you do one a year? Do you do one a week, one a day? Okay, very important. The numbers here do play a role, okay? And this, for you people, are the most important questions. 
What is your experience with neurologically based auditory problems? Okay. So in other words, do you see people with auditory problems with MS? Do you see them with stroke? Do you see them with degenerative disease? Do you see them with temporal lobectomy? Do you see them with hemispherectomy? Although those are pretty rare, but, uh, but if they do see those kinds of neurologically based patients, they are going to be better able to address your concerns and understand more about your child than if they did. And there are even fewer of those than there are the ones that we're talking about. But if you get a hold of one, you're going to be in good shape. Because there's a lot that can be done. The other question is, have you done continuing education in this area? Because this is a fast-moving area. And audiology in general is new, OK? It's new. It's kind of a new kid on the block. But this area is really fast-moving. And there's a lot of new things happening every day. Because we're involved in it. I can tell you directly. We're involved in a lot of this stuff. And it is moving quickly. You want to find people that have gone beyond their training. Because the training that they get it's a good start, but it's not sufficient. They have to learn more and more and more. That's a good question. And then the other thing is, do you do rehabilitation? Once you find the problem, can you do something to help that child with the problem? OK? All right. Well, remember, um, where am I going here? Remember, you didn't hear it here. <laughs> So as I said, how do, can I impart the understanding uh, to you people? Uh, I think the best way is maybe to teach you about the auditory system. And then you'll have at least conceptual knowledge, and maybe you'll be able to put a lot of, of these pieces together. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, here we go. So here we are. So we're looking at the auditory system. All right. This is the peripheral part or sometimes called the ear. What do you know about the ear? Well, we know a fair amount, okay? The peripheral auditory system primarily involves the ear, okay? And of course, out here you have the pinna and you have the ear canal. And it plays a bigger role than you think. It works like a funnel. And uh, it does funnel sound into the ear canal. And uh, if you have uh, various uh, unusual configurations of the ear canal, it can affect how you hear. But it's very subtle. You don't notice it much. The most common problem out here, of course, is wax. You get wax in the mm -hmm. Wax will create a blockage, a disallowing the sound waves to get further into the ear. And that's called a conductive loss. In fact, everything here that is in brown is what is called the conductive mechanism because it's conducting sound inward, okay? So if you have a problem in the external ear, wax, if you have a hole in the eardrum, or you have fluid behind the eardrum, such as an otitis media, those are all conductive hearing losses because the sound isn't being conducted like it should be. And practically all of those can be remedied quite easily, quite quickly, either surgically or medically, or just spontaneously. But I don't want to downplay them, because they can be a factor. The most, the biggest culprit here is otitis media. Why? Because children, by the time they reach six, over 90% of all of them, I don't care what strata they come from, where they are, they're going to have otitis media at least one episode of it, okay? And that cuts down on the hearing. Now, if you have repeated episodes of it, of course, that may encourage such things as surgery or uh, treatment uh, to resolve it, but that can work. The problem is you don't want to let it go on too long because of the fact it attenuates the sound coming in and when you attenuate the sound coming in, there are certain things you are not going to hear, okay? For example, if I said uh, baseball 
The B that you hear is bodacious. Ba, ba. But compare that to, well, let's have some fun. The difference in those two phonemes is huge. So it means you have a little bit of hearing loss, you might hear the B, but you're not going to hear the, the F or the V or the R high S or the S H. Well, what happens when a child doesn't hear those? They have no reference. They have no reference. They think sounds, they think words are like that. Okay. And then what does it do? It has a residual effect on reading, spelling, and a whole bunch of things by the time they hit first, second, third, fourth grade. So we gotta make sure that this conductive system is conducting and working okay. All right, then we move on here into the, into the uh, inner ear or internal ear here, which is a snail-shaped bony structure, and inside of it's filled with fluid. And it has many little specialized cells with little uh, stereocilar hair on them, and the hair moves back and forth on the fluid, and that's what creates our ability to actually perceive sound. And that's called the cochlea or the sensory neural part. So if this is conductive, now this is sensory because those are little sensory cells. And this is the nerve, the auditory nerve, and that's neural. Okay, so they call it sensory neural. So if you damage the cochlea or you damage the nerve, you're going to have a sensory neural hearing loss. Now for the most part, those are permanent. They're not going to change a whole lot. There are some exceptions uh, to that. But generally speaking, those are going to be a permanent type thing. What is the main culprit? Uh, even in kids, it's pretty common. Noise-induced hearing loss. That's by far the, the greatest uh, pathology related to cochlear dysfunction, okay? And so I remember uh, seeing a little nine-year-old, 10-year-old a number of years ago, came in, he had a high-frequency sensory nerve hearing loss. And I told the mom, I said, it looks like he has a noise-induced hearing loss. I said, he's only nine years old. What could he be doing that would cause a noise-induced hearing loss? And mom says, well, I don't know. I, I, he's not exposed. He doesn't do any shooting. He's only nine. He doesn't listen to loud music. Uh, he says, I, I don't know. Then I, you know, I, I said, well, maybe it's congenital or maybe there's a genetic factor, and I'm trying to figure it out, and um, um, finally the last question I asked was, I said, well, what does he do on a regular day? Tell me what he does on a regular day, and mom said, well, he goes to school, da, 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 da. he comes home, and uh, usually when he comes home, he rides a snowmobile, a snowmobile in, in the winter, and I said, does he wear a helmet? She said, yeah. This little nine-year-old kind of got on the snowmobile for an hour and a half every afternoon, back and forth in the winter. Mm -hmm. Since you know him loss, you know he's induced. So it's the most common thing. Uh, we're not going to see it a lot in kids. Uh, more in kids, you're going to see something that is genetically related uh, than more than most anything else. And then the auditory nerve, uh, you will see neuropathy of the auditory nerve and those are also pretty rare, um, or various kinds of things that will affect auditory nerve, but not a whole lot usually in uh, the populations that we're thinking about in terms of kids. Uh, so that's kind of what we have here. We have sensory neural hearing loss, and that's what that is. So um, you have to attend to this, because if you also have a central deficit, this will compound the problem. This will compound the problem. And so you have to be sure that the periphery is working well. All right? So now we move on into the brain and what is called the central auditory nervous system. And uh, it does a lot of processing. Well, what do we mean about a lot of processing? Well, it does a lot of things in, in terms of allowing us to understand what our environment is, okay? So it allows us to discriminate sounds, it allows us to identify sounds, it allows us to uh, rapidly uh, understand information, 
And what's interesting about it, this is actually the cochlea and the auditory nerve leading into the brain stem, which is an exa exaggerated uh, diagram here. Uh, but there are a bunch of nuclei going up the brain stem, all of which do certain kinds of processing. But the thing that I want to impress upon you is this, is that if you take a look here at the auditory nerve feeding into the brain stem from the periphery down there, and you count the number of fibers in the human auditory nerve, it's about 30,000. Actually, cats have more than we do. Cats have about 45,000. <laughs> But we have about 30,000 fibers. However, if you count the number of fibers going into the cortex, there's probably a million. So what happens? You get a tremendous explosion of neurons going up the pathway. It's called neural arborization. So why did nature give us a million fibers up there and only 30,000 down there? The answer is because it's got to do a lot more things. Okay? It's got to do a lot more things. And some of the things we're going to get into, which are really astounding in terms of how the system works and how fast it works. So the central auditory nervous system also has one characteristic that is different than the periphery, among others, but one I want to bring up. Remember when I said if you have a, um, a, a sensory nerve hearing loss, such as noise-induced hearing loss or <coughs> too many ototoxic drugs or things like that, that is going to be permanent. It's not going to change. In the brain, believe it or not, it's highly plastic. And it can change, okay? You heard the lectures maybe this morning about plasticity. Well, it applies here too. If you get the right, the right situation, the right kind of training, the brain becomes very plastic and you can actually make up for deficits that are here that you can't out in the periphery. So it's an important difference that we'll expand upon later. And this is just another picture of it, uh, showing the connections. So let's talk more about hearing. Well, if we look up in the brain, which we all here are kind of interested in, we have frontal lobe, and talking about things in very general, the frontal lobe is responsible for a lot of behaviors, but it's probably most responsible for a lot of cognition, okay? And the way that the frontal lobe works is it receives information from all the areas and processes it. The parietal lobe is primarily motor and somatosensory. Okay. Uh, occipital lobe is primarily visual. Okay. Temporal lobe, at least the superior part, is auditory. Okay. So anytime we hear the term temporal lobe, the first thing you should think about is auditory. That's the home of the central auditory nervous system. It's the auditory cortex. It's where most of the things and most of the processing, but not all of it, uh, takes place. So that's our temporal lobe. So when you hear temporal and temporal lobe, you automatically you need to think about auditory and you need to think about central. Okay. Not peripheral, but central, and temporal lobe. So when we talk about temporal lobe activity, you have that seizure activity right in the lobe that's also responsible for hearing. So it's pretty hard to have a normally functioning temporal lobe when you have seizure disorder that is uh, you know, affecting it. So again, just to show you the arrangement here so you have some background on the anatomy of this. All right, now I showed this uh, picture uh, yesterday. And this is where we kind of get down to brass tacks here a little bit. So peripheral versus central. The more complex the stimulus, okay, the more complexity, the more the brain is going to become involved, okay? Now, there is not anything that you or I hear that doesn't involve both the peripheral and the central nervous system in terms of hearing, okay? So, we're all clear on that. It's not that one does all the work, the other one doesn't. 
but there is a complexity gradient. So, remember when I said, well, we had a million fibers up there, they ought to be doing something? They're going to handle the more complex stuff. That's why they're there, okay? So as the complexity gets greater, the involvement in the brain becomes more and more and more and more. If the stimuli and or the task related to the auditory stimulus is relatively simple, the peripheral system is going to be involved more. Is the brain going to be involved? Yeah. Much? No. <laughs> okay. No. So simple stimuli, and this is kind of a rule of thumb, the more simple the stimulus, the more the periphery is going to be important. The more complex it is, the more the brain is going to be involved. And that's an important principle, concept to understand. Okay? So what are some simple acoustic signals in everyday life? Well, a whistle is simple, okay? A whistle is very simple, it's not complex. It's usually one frequency. It's usually pretty loud, so we don't have trouble hearing it. That's a simple stimulus. Periphery's not being involved a lot. Brain, yes, will be involved because you will identify it as a whistle. That's gonna cause the brain to do some work. But this is pretty simple. A siren, warning device. But it's a simple sound. There's not much to it. A bell ringing, a little more complex, but that's still pretty simple. Telephone ringing, simple. Knock at the door. This is the stuff that the brain has to work hard for, okay? Pretty simple stuff. Some speech in a quiet room like this is actually can be relatively simple. So these are examples of simple things in the environment. What are some of complex things? Like speech is complex. Why? Because all those phonemes vary in frequency, and they vary in intensity, and they do it extremely fast. And the auditory system is going to grab all that. That's complex. Okay. But if you really want to be complex, Let's all go out in the hall and start talking to each other, and then try to pick one person out and find out what they're saying. That is a tough task. And there is where you're going to see the brain really get to work. Okay? That's why your children, and I would guess most of them, if you look at it closely, they will tell you, or they will, you will observe, they have trouble hearing the noise. Now, everybody has trouble hearing the noise, even the best of us, but the gradient is much different for them. This kind of situation is going to be tough for them. They don't have the mechanisms needed to suppress the background noise and enhance the foreground noise. So this is an example of complex stimulus that's going to be affected. Echoing rooms, if you take your children if they are in school and they go to the gymnasium, it's going to be unbelievable. Why? Because gymnasiums are echoey. They don't have good acoustics. And any place aren't good acoustics, these kids are going to have trouble. Some will have a little bit, some will have a lot, and there'll be a spectrum. But they will. They will. So let me tell you a story about the central nervous system and uh, echoing rooms. So a number of years ago, I was at Dartmouth Medical School. I was there for 26 years. Uh, and I saw a lot of interesting patients. And uh, this one was a 30-year-old businessman, young guy, who worked in New York. And he drove uh, to Vermont. Uh, one day in the winter, and it was on Friday, I believe, and he went skiing. Well, when he went skiing, he actually had a stroke. He was always only 30. He had a stroke. I guess there's proclivity in his family for that. So anyway, he had a stroke, and um, they released him from the hospital. He had some freezes on, I think, the left side. And they said, you need to go to physical therapy and work on getting this motor system going again on your left side. 
And he said, well, I live close to Hanover, so could I just go down there? For the, and they said, absolutely. So he made an appointment and uh, did physical therapy. And the therapy was specifically water therapy. They wanted him to get in the pool and do different kinds of exercises. <coughs> So his first day at uh, coming into Dartmouth, uh, he um, asked for a wheelchair. So when he came in, the uh, attendant came over, got him in the wheelchair, and started wheeling him down to the pool area, which was a ways away from where he was. So the attendant, you know, started talking with him. And they were carrying on a good conversation. They had about five, six, seven minutes to get to the pool area. And so they're talking along, you know, and saying, yeah, how are you, and how's the weather, oh, it's terrible, and all this, and we're going. And all of a sudden, they're approaching the pool area, and the attendant wheels him into the pool area, and the poor patient becomes alarmed. He says, I can't hear it. I, I, I don't understand what you're saying. Say it again. And then he really got back this, it sounds terrible. I can't understand what you're saying. And the attendant is putting two and two together and says, turns around, wheels him back out into the hallway away from the pool area, and the patient says, oh, phew. Yeah, I can understand you now. What was happening? He had damaged his central nervous system, and he simply couldn't tolerate the echoey sounds because the brain could not process the high distortion that you see in a pool area. You know when you go to a pool area, that goes all over the place, it's gonna handle it. So that was a pretty good example of that. Oftentimes, music will not be appreciated as much as it once was, okay? Or the musical skills will sometimes drift away in these kids. Why? Because the central nervous system is primarily responsible for music interpretation. Many people talking at once is going to be a problem, okay? So if you have more than one person talking, it's going to be a problem. And people that talk to a faster one, they're going to have a hard time. And so these are all little things that if you apply them to your everyday situation, you might be surprised how much you can help uh, your child in terms of actual hearing. Simple auditory tasks, well, there's only one that's really, really simple, and that is the detection of sound. Very important, but, it's very simple. Yes, I hear the sound, or no, I don't. Those of you that get an audio cam, that's all they do. Do you hear the sound? No. Yes, no. Yes, no. They don't ask anything about how it sounds. They just ask whether you hear it or not. It's a detection test, okay? That's only one small parameter of hearing. But it is also the most simple and an important one. So when we do an audiogram, that's primarily what we're doing. Can you detect the sound? Which is very important, okay? The unfortunate thing about this is that too many audiologists out there and other people think that this is actually a, a test of hearing. It's not. It's a test of detection of sound. But for many years, this is all we had to work with, so yeah, it was as, as good as we could do. But now it's much different. The audiogram is not a test of hearing. It's a test of one small segment of hearing. A normal audiogram does not mean normal hearing. There are too many other things that require normal hearing that an audiogram simply does not test. Now, as I said before, if the audiogram shows hearing loss, it's very important to address that. Why? because it can make all the difference in the world. But with most people with central nervous system abnormalities, including epilepsy, temporal lobectomy, hemispherectomy, most of them, unless they have an ongoing peripheral problem, will have normal audiograms. But I can tell you they don't have normal hearing. Okay. So what are some of these complex tasks that we really need to know about in order to really assess hearing? Well, one of the most important ones is the ability to discriminate. The ability to discriminate one sound from the other based on its pitch or its intensity or its duration. 
Where do we do that most commonly all the time? We do it when we listen to speech. Why? Because all the phonemes we listen to are different in pitch. A ba is different than a a. Ah, and a s is different than a d. Well, those are all different pitches, and they're all different intensities, OK? And they're all going to sound the same if you can't discriminate sounds. Discrimination is one of the higher auditory processes, OK? And discrimination is often at deficit when you have central, as well in some cases, peripheral hearing loss. Timing is important, OK? Timing is important. And the ability to successively analyze bits of sound over time is probably one of the most important processes that we have. And again, let's look at speech as an example. Did you know that some parts of uh, the transition from a, a consonant to a vowel, like bat, although that's not a good example because it takes on that. But some of these transitions are so fast that they are on the order, okay, of milliseconds, of thousands of a second. And the auditory system's got to be able to pick up that change in literally milliseconds of time. It is mind-boggling what this can do, okay? To give you a reference, if you blink, as fast as you can. Everybody blink. That blink time is 10 to 20 milliseconds, which is about the same that it takes for some of these transitions in speech to take place so that you can tell one phony from another phony. And the auditory system does that. But if those neurons in the brain are not working fast enough, or if they're not there because they've been taken away, there's no way to process that quick. It just doesn't happen. And so what happens is you may get the word, maybe with a little concentration, and as long as there's not a whole bunch of words coming after it, but it's a text. It's a text. Localization of sounds. Okay, localization. Very critical. Chemistry, I can kids I worry about because of the fact, like we tell the young kids, real young kids, who come in with a unilateral peripheral hearing loss on one side, first thing I tell mom and dad, I say, hey, watch this kid crossing the street. Because his localization is going to be way off. He'll think that the car's coming this way, and it's actually coming this way. Well, the same thing happens in the brain because the brain also does localization. And if one part of the brain is working well and the other one isn't, the localization, and we showed yesterday in my brief demonstration, I said how far localization is off when you have an hysterectomy. Make sure that they understand this localization thing. And also, though, can be trained, believe it or not. You can make it better by training. Listening to multiple sounds and signals, that's always you know, a task. We've talked about that. And the identifying acoustic sounds in events. You know, what was that sound? How quick can you identify what that was? Even if it doesn't quite sound like what it usually sounds like, can you identify what that is? You know, can you filter it in such a way that what comes through is the key thing? So that uh, is the word Dan or Dan. You know, those small differences. So identifying acoustic elements and what they are is part of important too, and what the central nervous system does. Whoops. All right, so just to give you an example, this is a cartoon slide. It is not meant to be accurate, but it is kind of accurate. Okay. So we do a lot of MRI and fMRI looking at brain when people are listening to things. So if you present a tonal signal, B, 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 something like that, or a whistle, or some of these simple sounds, and you look at the auditory cortex, and you analyze 
how much of that auditory cortex is actually involved in uh, that are activated when this simple sound comes on. It'll look something like that, the little blue marker. Why? Because the cortex is a, is a, runs with the big dogs. Okay? It's not interested in a lot of these very simple stimuli. Okay? It's just not. Okay? It doesn't need to be, because they don't really need to be processed. So if you look at this with a PET, positive animation tomography, or fMRI, or MRIs, You'll see it's not much. These simple tones don't do much up there. But if you do a dichotic listening pass where you have to listen to speech in both ears at the same time, that's how much is involved. So you see how the cortex becomes more and more involved. Now, obviously, if in fact you have that, okay and you have a hemisphere or temporal lobe taken away, you're not missing much, and the other side can probably handle it, okay? You're not gonna say a lot of problems. But, as I showed yesterday, when this happens and you take that away, there's a problem. There's a problem with that particular kind of task. Why? The neurons aren't there. Okay, so. So, auditory is the fuel of speech and language. You take away auditory, you're gonna take away speech and language. Okay, there ain't no way it survives without it. Now, with special training, sure, you can circumvent it and you establish some language, have a heck of a time establishing speech, but just look at the uh, kids who do that. They read at a third grade level after 12 years of school. Why? They're not getting the auditory representation. So it becomes a very important to understand the cascade effect. It starts with the auditory, and all these other things fall in line. For the first two or 300 milliseconds of experiencing the sound, the only thing that actually happens is in the auditory cortex. The rest of the brain is waiting to get the signals. So, speech and language, and then of course, cognition and memory are also driven by speech and language, which is driven by auditory. So if you take auditory away, you take away the foundation of these things, okay? And you see the arrows go both ways. And that's very true. Because you know, as, you, as I'm talking to you, I'm monitoring my own voice. You take people with severe hearing problems, they can't monitor their own voice. They talk high, low, loud, soft. They have no idea. But it's a gradation. That's an extreme example. Other examples where people don't monitor well, their voice isn't always the best as it could be. Okay? So it works both ways. The system feeds back to auditory, and auditory feeds the system. So it's not functioning by itself, and so many people forget this slide. The other day I heard these excellent speakers, great researchers, talk about, the first thing they talk about up here is language. Nobody said auditory. You take an auditory, you don't have language. Okay? Auditory is there first. Language develops much later, and it develops from what children hear. There's no big secret about that. Thousands of papers have been written on that. So remember this effect that we see as a foundational factor here. So how do we test the central auditory nervous system? Well, you don't want to use simple stimuli. You all know that now. If you use simple stimuli like in an audiogram, you're not going to have anything to do with the central nervous system. It's going to just kind of laugh at it's going to have to be complex stimuli. Okay? And you know the reason why. So I want to tell you another little story. And this is an interesting story, how this whole idea got started many, many years ago, because it's very instructive, I think. It started with a guy by the name of Ettore Boca in Rome, Italy. Okay? Boca was a, what we would call now, an ear, nose, and throat 
specialist, okay? And he was in charge of a big hospital in Italy. And uh, this is back in the mid-50s. And at that point in time, one of the new things that they had was an audiometer. An audiometer can do a pure tone audiogram. Okay, so it, it presents different sounds. You, anybody that's had the hearing test knows what an audiometer is, okay? Different frequencies, different sounds, different intensities. Boca was in charge of two floors on the hospital. He was in charge of the otologic floor, meaning people that had ear problems, okay? But he was also in charge of the neurological ward, which was someplace else in the hospital. And so over the years, Boca, who was very astute, started to notice some very interesting things. He said, it seems as though when I get a patient from the otologic wards, the problem, ear problem ward, and I do an audiogram on them, they have a hearing loss. And they complain of hearing difficulties. And he says, that made perfect sense, super. But he says, I'm getting these patients from the neurological wards and they're saying, they never complain a lot, but they always complain a little. And they say, you know, I'm not hearing very good. And lo and behold, I test them on audiogram, and the audiogram's always wrong. And he said, it doesn't make sense to me. Why is that? And he kept saying this year after year after year. He says, the otologic ward, they have an abnormal audiogram. The neurological ward, they complain, they have trouble hearing. And they have a normal audiogram. What the heck is going on? Well, Boca is a smart guy, and he says, we're not testing whatever is wrong with those people on the neurological ward. We're not testing it. We are not testing it. And in 1955-54, he presented one of the first papers on central auditory dysfunction. Because he made up, designed some tests that were complex because he thought the peritone audio is too simple. It's not measuring what the problem is. So he made a more complex test, and that kind of set the world on its ear because nobody ever heard of such a thing before. Because everybody thought all the hearing took place in the ear, now we know that all the hearing takes place in the brain. The ear can't hear anything without the brain. So that is where we got started. And it's been a long, winding, tough road, but we are at a point now where we have tremendous test procedures, if they're done by the right people, to isolate these central auditory deficits, okay? So what a lot of these tests are called, they're called sensitized central tests. And why they're called sensitized is because they're sensitive to auditory brain function and not necessarily the peripheral problem. Okay. And then a lot of people have developed these tests. We've spent 35 years developing a number of these that you will use if you ever go to an audiologist to do this. You'll probably be using my tests. Here's one of them. It's called dichotic listening. And dichotic listening is actually what happens a lot in our environment. If you're at a cocktail party and you're talking to someone next to you and you know they're talking to you over here, and then over there waves on the other side, all of a sudden you hear your name mentioned. And what do you do? You're listening to this person, but you hear your name saying, oh, geez, what is And you're able to go over there and focus your attention. What was that? But you can still pick up on what this person is saying, what this person is saying. That's called dichotic listening in a practical situation. Well, we made a test out of it, and what we do is we do digits or words or parts of words, and we present them at the same time, two different stimuli to each year, dichotic or saying, people with central dysfunction can't do this test. And they fall apart because it requires a tremendous amount of neural substrate. This is a hard thing to do. Okay? And it puts tremendous demand on the central nervous system. So if it's not working right, you're going to see deficit. A friend of mine calls it, this is like the stress test of hearing. You know? when you're, when you're, the doctor says, get, get on that stress machine and think about how you're doing with it. Well, this is the stress test of, of 
the auditory system, okay? Localization, which is very important, as we've talked to you before, this is another test that can be done, okay, with uh, good audiologists who know what they're doing. Uh, localization is very good, not only in terms of telling where things come from, but again, if you're at a cocktail party and you want to listen to that person over there, what you have to do before you do anything else, you have to localize where they are. And as the quicker you can localize, the quicker you're going to be able to pick up on what they are saying. So in a cocktail party effect, a lot of background noise, localization actually becomes quite important in kind of a different respect. And we'll elaborate on that a little bit later. Oh, we're going to elaborate on it now. Okay. So this is kind of amazing because a lot of this is just, it's intuitive, but yet it's clever. And it's really kind of amazing. And it has to do with spatial cues. So, let's say we have two people talking to each other. And you're down here. You're the listener. And those two people are pretty close together, okay? And you want to understand what both of them are saying. Well, it's going to be pretty hard to do that, okay, in that situation, okay? Because the sounds, the acoustics are coming about the same and they're going to arrive at your ears at about the same time. Maybe a little bit different. Would you know how you could actually make yourself hear these people? You, could, you may not, it may not be like night and day, but it will make a difference. That's this. Spread them apart. Because what happens is now this pathway of the acoustic stimuli, and this pathway are different. This pathway is going to take longer to get to your ear than the other pathway. And that small difference in time will actually give the auditory system a chance to start to interpret both the stimuli. So, uh, we teach our students about how spatial cues, if you set them up right, and let's say that, uh, let's say this person is talking to me and you're talking to me. And I'm here, okay? So what could, if I, other than saying, why don't you move over there, you know, do that. <laughs> but what you could do is you could move, I could move like this. And then what happens is that this signal now is going to be di more different than this signal and the brain stem can actually start to differentiate the sounds and you pick up cues. It's an amazing situation that a lot of people don't play on, especially they like to teach teachers in the classroom about this because it could help a lot of the students and the teachers for that matter about how to uh, better hear in a noisy situation. So spatial and localization is important. The other thing I uh, alluded to this, this is a digital representation of someone saying there are natural gaps of silence in speech. And this goes to the timing part of it. This is another interesting thing. So in fact, did you know it's just as important to not hear something that isn't there as it is to hear something that is there? Because that's what our speech is based on. If you don't have these gaps in speech and in individual phonemes, and if you get rid of them by actually taking out the space, and we've done this for years, people can't understand it. It's too fast. It's too fast. And so what happens is they don't get it. Because the timing of the system is not fast enough. You follow me? Now think about Temporal lobectomy and hemisterectomy, when you're taking away all, you're taking away thousands, hundreds of thousands of auditory neurons. That becomes very difficult to do. Very difficult to do. Because you have to have a huge complement of these central auditory neurons working top right to do some of this stuff. It's not easy. It's not easy. So you have to hear the phony, but then you also have to have those nerves shut down totally, very quickly, 
to make sure there's silence and then back up again. That's a tough task. But our system can do it, but it has to be in tip top shape to do it. And if it isn't, it's going to create that problem. Okay? And the other thing, of course, we do, and we presented this the other day about some data on this, is that speech and noise. Yes, when you have a lot of background noise, it's going to be tough. Okay, it's going to be tough. Tough situation for everyone. But it's really tough when you don't have, again, a full complement of auditory system working. Boy, I'm running out of time, I always do. So these are the kind of things that happen. We have an ipsilateral, contralateral system. The ear that's going to be the problem is going to be the ear opposite the lesion. So if there's a hemispherectomy on the left hemisphere, it's going to be the right ear that is down. The ipsilateral ear, or the ear on the side of the lesion, is going to do OK. Why? Because it's mostly contralateral fibers that are being damaged, see? So if you have a left hemispherectomy, the right ear is going to suffer. Okay. Even though the periphery is totally intact, it's still going to suffer in terms of what it can appreciate and what it can do. And da 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 whatever. Okay. So what can I give you in terms of some things for you to watch out for? Well, what are some symptoms of CAPD? Okay, what are some of those things? Well, you know. What I like to say about this is that these symptoms can be related to a lot of other things. But it will get you in the right church. It won't get you in the right pew. You're going to have to have sophisticated testing to get you in the right pew. But it will get you in the right church. Okay. So difficulty in noise environment. You know this now. Okay. Difficulty in reverberant, echoey rooms. You know, when there are complaints of that, and sometimes it won't be complaints, you'll just observe it if it's a problem. Difficulty following multi-step directions. You know, they get the first one or two, and the third one and can't do. Right? Um, appears to have problems listening. You know, sometimes they actually are doing this, or they're trying to do this, or they just give up because it's too hard. Difficulty following fast talkers or those with soft voices. Don't get a teacher that has a soft voice and talks fast if you're a kid in school. Oh, it's trouble. You probably already know that. You've learned it empirically, but scientifically, it's also been shown. And when I was working with the schools at Dartmouth, that's what I always used to do. They had the end of the year, the, what do they call them, the IEP things? <laughs> they hated to see me come in because they'd say, well, Johnny's going into fourth grade. OK, tell me about the fourth grade teachers. You know, I asked the principal, whoever was there, tell me about the fourth grade teachers. They said, well, so and so, so. Well, what about some? Well, she has a real soft voice. Don't get Johnny in that class. <laughs> I tell you right now, it's going to be a problem. So, OK, we'll get him someplace else. Or, oh, she talks really fast, and she's really busy all the time. Don't get Johnny in that class. Don't get problem. And there are things that you can do along those lines. Misinterpret words, numbers, damn, ban, things like that. See? Challenged by language-based subjects in school. And sometimes this is good for most kids with CAPD, but probably not good uh, symptom analysis for your kids because they have too many other things going on. This may not hold true because often with your kids, there will also be math and science difficulties along with this. It's a little bit different game. The key is this, and I usually say this. When these kids would come in to see me, the first thing I ask, mom and dad, have you had an audio grant done? And a lot of them would say, yeah, we've had three. I said, well, why have you, why you had three? And they kept saying, because they all came back normal. And I didn't believe it. That's a dead giveaway. When you have a normal audiogram and the symptoms are still there, it's probably a central deficit of some sort. It can be little, it can be big. And that should wake you up a little bit. Okay? And then, I don't know what else I have here. 
Thank you. That's it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Frank. Um, if anyone wants to ask questions at this time, I think there's a 15-minute session built in. And please uh, grab an email on your way out if you're going to leave right now. Yes, question. Why is it, or how do we interpret when a child obviously has some components of simple auditory processing? Like they do have a difficult time with localization or discrimination, but then they have what appears to be absolutely no problem with other other components. Is that typical? What does that mean? Do we still pursue? Well, I'll put it this way: it's it's not. Yeah. It's. <laughs> I have to do this because we're paying. It. It's not atypical. Okay. Is it typical? But see, in your case, if you're talking about hemispherectomy or hemorrhagia, <laughs> what very well could be happening is that one the thing that they are doing well may be a responsibility of the other hemisphere, the intact hemisphere. Mm -hmm. While the thing they're doing poorly may be dependent on the hemisphere that has their reception. So that's a, and we haven't talked about that, I can't talk about it. Either. But there is a designation, right and left, in terms of the kinds of tasks that the system does. A good assessment person doing an evaluation, could they figure that out? The what? If uh, whoever was doing, if they're doing a good auditory processing assessment on a kid, could they figure that out? Oh yeah, you can figure that out, that out with the testing. Okay. But you probably don't need to, because what you really do for the rehabilitation is that, in fact, you look at the deficit and work on the deficit, regardless of where it's coming from. Okay. Next, next question is kind of similar to yours. Um, my son had a, a right intracardiac at 13 months, and he's two now, and he just had all the hearing tests, and like you said, everything came back with what seemed to be perfect, but the neurosurgeon was like, well, there's definitely gonna be some deficit from the surgery. And um, like you said, I feel like my son is really strong in some areas and weak in others, but like, is, after you do the test, is there anything in place that can help him, or is it all just things that you're working on at home and rehab and stuff, or are there any type of medical you know, devices or anything like that? Yeah, there is. And um, I can't go into that today. But the truth of the matter is that two big things, one is auditory training, which would be one. And that's, again, you have to have someone that knows what they're doing. Uh, and the other thing is assistive listening devices. Now, and I'm talking about an assistive listening device for people that have a normal audio. Because what it does is it affords an improved signal-to-noise ratio. It gives you a little bit of amplification, but it improves the signal-to-noise ratio. Now, often these are not applied until they get into school, where it really becomes necessary. But if he has passed his infant screening, okay, which I guess he has, or she, I'm not sure, um, then that's great because that means his periphery is pushing the information up there and all he's got to do or she's got to do is be able to manipulate that. So, what you should be doing, okay, is expose, how old are they again? He's um, a little over two. He's what? A little over two years old. A little over two, okay. Is he, does he walk? No. Okay. All right, well then, so what you, you want to do, and you probably do this already, but uh, get him in the stroll or whatever and take him in situations where he can be exposed to all kinds of sound. The more, the better. You need to talk to him all the time. I mean, all the time. Just like you were talking to me, I don't care. You don't have to use baby language. Just keep talking. Expose him to all the possible things. Have him start to localize sound, you know. Okay, make a sound over there and see if he does that. And if once he does it, then just keep doing it. But do it all over the place. And then reward him to do that. You need to start having the plasticity of the brain take over for what is missing. And the only way that you can do that is stimulation, 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 stimulation with a wide variety of different kinds of environmental sounds as well as speech. That's the best thing you can do at this particular point in time. And the other thing is make sure it's loud enough so, he, so that he doesn't have to strain to hear it. Because the louder it is, the more the brain is going to respond. Okay. 
So you need the loudness issue, you need multi-frequencies, you need all kinds of different environmental sounds, take them outside, listen to the birds, listen to the traffic, listen to the sirens, listen to whatever, and just keep doing that. The more that you can do, the more experience you will have, the more you'll be able to play on plasticity, and by the time he reaches kindergarten or first grade, he's going to be ahead of where he would have been if you didn't do these things. But it gets monotonous and it gets tiring. Yeah. But you gotta keep after it. It's like most things. You guys are better than that than me, probably. I can do it. But you guys have great tenacity. So and a lot of it can be fun. And a lot of it he will enjoy, you know. And just make sure that he's awake. Yeah. <laughs> I have a friend who the child went to sleep all the time. He's, oh yeah, we go for a stroll all the time. He's, oh, I said that's really good. You have all kinds of sounds. You have all kinds of sounds. Yeah, but he sleeps all the time. <laughs> you gotta be awake. <laughs> you know, that, that's another amazing thing. You know, uh, about hearing is that I gotta bring this out. Oh, I have time for this. I gotta bring this amazing thing. So, um, one of the amazing things, phenomenological, is people that snore. And a lot of the snore, but some people snore really loud. And you know that snoring never wakes a person up. And they recorded snoring at 110 decibels. <laughs> no, really. Uh, and just about anybody who snores is like 80 or 90. And they don't wake up. They sleep all night. However, you take a mom that has a newborn child will be in two rooms away. <laughs> no, they, they show this. Oh, yeah. Two rooms away, the baby goes, eh, eh. Mom's up. <laughs> figure that one out. <laughs> I, we've been trying to figure it out. We can't figure it out. Why is that? There's something amazing that's going on there that we just can't figure out. I'd like to figure that out. I think we have time for like two more questions. Okay. So I think she had... Um, I know you don't have time. I mean, know you don't have time to talk about the different types of rehab, mm -hmm. which you referenced several times that it can be done. Can you at least share some resources where we can explore further? Oh yeah, I mean, that was my question too. We, pu we published eleven books. Okay, two of the uh, one of them uh, in 2014 is called. Uh, Handbook for Central Auditory Processing Deficit or dis Dysfunction or whatever, I'm not sure what it is, title of it. And uh, volume two of that book is 750 pages of nothing but what you're talking about. Okay, all kinds of, uh, of uh, oral rehabilitative uh, studies, uh, things that have been done. There's a lot out there. But that area has gone like a rocket ship in the last five years. Not from our field, but from neuroscience people that have really pushed it because they can see how what a difference it's making. So there's information out there, and uh, we have some stuff on our website. Our website is neuroaudiology. Uh, I just put in neuroaudiology, my name will come up, and then you can use it. But but uh, you know, I don't like to push my books, but uh, you know, that's it is probably the best resource right now is that. Uh, 700 pages worth of uh, different things in terms of rehabilitation of this. Because the brain is plastic. And so there's a lot of things you can do with central deficit. So you didn't call um, it B-treating. Hmm? That sounds like B-treating. Yeah, so it'll put you to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> One more, I guess. Any other questions? In the back. Yeah. Okay. Good. I just wanted to know uh, to what extent the plasticity could help. Uh, you mentioned we were losing hundreds of thousands of neurons from the resection. To what extent can the plasticity recover? 10%, 100%? And is it a function of the age of the surgery or not? Good question. I can, I can answer it from a neuroanatomy standpoint and also from an audiology standpoint. It never will recover 100%. Not going to happen. Okay. It can recover a lot. We cover a lot of it, but it's just not going not gonna to happen. And uh, um, it'll recover, there's evidence it'll cover, recover more than 50% then, depending on the constellation, the neurons, and what they have to do in the past to hand. But it's just not a feasible thing to think that you're going to get 100% back. It's, it's not going to happen. But the good news is that for 
most things in our environment, you don't need 100%. You know? If you have 70%, you're gonna do pretty darn well. It's just like, well, reading, you know. Well, I can only read at a fourth grade level. Well, guess what? That's really all you need. You're gonna do perfectly fine at a fourth grade level in the United States at this point in time. Well, it's a little bit like that. You're not gonna get 100% back, and you're not gonna do 100% on these tests. But, you know, with a lot of training, and, and, and deficit training, working at the things that show deficit, you can get a lot of that back. How much, you guys know better than me. It's when the surgery was done, how long the surgery took, the anatomy of the surgery, all those kinds of things play into it. So I'm talking in very general terms here. But you're not gonna get 100%. But you could come back a lot. It's 311, we have a coordinate angle with my coffin. I just quickly, in that same vein, is there anything you can tell us about the difference, uh, the function of the right temporal lobe versus function of the left temporal lobe? Just generally. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, that's um, one that I've spent 30 years, <laughs> you know, it's hard for me to be still it. But um, the biggest thing is right temporal lobe it has a little bit better frequency discrimination than the left. It does a little bit better in terms of temporal processing than the left. The left plays a big role in linguistically labeling stimuli that come up to it, either via the corpus callosum or the pathways. You damage one, and surprisingly, the other will take up a lot of the difference. Going back to your question, and that's what happens, is that it's classic enough that the other one will do pretty well, um, but it's not comfortable, it's not at home. Um, so, but they do do different things, but there's a lot of overlay and there's a lot of redundancy in that. When we uh, did the research on the split brain subjects at Dartmouth, we were able to look at what the right hemisphere did and the left hemisphere independent of one another. And when you put them together, there was a summating effect, meaning that individually, they could do things, but they could never do what they could do when you put them together. So the, the real summation point is to try to get the two together. And of course, with your kinds of patients, as your, your kids are, that's gonna be hard to do. But there's also other ways of working around around it, which I you know I wish I could spend some time and, and talk about, you know, the different circuitries and how you can approach them and how you might be able to offset some of these difficulties. Uh, but a lot of it is on the fly. I mean, you have to know enough about physiology and anatomy and pathophysiology to figure out, in your particular case, we need to do this, but in your particular case, we can't. We gotta do this because the anatomy is different. And that's where the, the real difference starts to come in. You know, not it's not gonna be one for all and all for one. It's gonna be on an individual basis. But someone has gotta know the system well enough to say, this has a chance here. Ain't no way it's working there. And this will work back there, but it's not going to work here. And there is when you have a good therapist who has that ability to be able to do that. Okay, they're waiting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.